Hello. Hope you're doing fine and that you had a nice uh, rest and spring break. So we'll continue back um, with the last part of basically quantum dynamics. Mm, so far we have covered a time dependent uh, perturbation theory, which is related to the treatment of um, more complex problems where you want to find the time evolution based on the knowledge of a simpler problem and the perturbation expansion trying to approximate um, the more complicated one. So, but formally speaking, it's basically a mathematical method to deal with the time evolution of a quantum problem. So the last uh, concept that we'll examine related to this quantum dynamics, being the evolution in time for quantum problems is related to something called the adiabatic approximation and a related concept called uh, Barry's phase. So let me share the screen. Okay. So yeah, as I was saying, uh, basically this is the last piece of the puzzle regarding our cooperation quantum dynamics, where before we have seen time dependent perturbation theory. And uh, this last concept or usually called adiabatic approximation. It's when you make, a, well, you have a time dependent Hamiltonian, but the Hamiltonian changes very slowly. So slow that it's almost imperceptible how the Hamiltonian changes in time. Uh, however, it still has some impact in the change of the weight function. Uh, so it's not equal as the case where the Hamiltonian is time independent. And so in this uh, complexity is what relies on um, the so-called adiabatic approximation. Barry's phase, uh, shortly speaking, is when you have a Hamiltonian that is time dependent, that has a very slow change, but it returns after a given time to the original initial state at um, time zero, let's say, at the initial time. So um, although it returns to the original initial state, there is an impact in basically the so-called geometric phase of the wave function. Um, so we'll describe in more detail these concepts. Uh, I just want to give a preliminary um, indication of what we'll cover. And OK, let's start with the adiabatic theorem. It was the original Etoyan fest in more modern versions to born in Puck. And the statement, uh, I'm gonna give first uh, some sort of um, heuristic statement and then perhaps more formally what it says. So it says the following, uh, let's assume that the Hamiltonian changes is low enough in time from its original form um, H at time zero to a final form H at time T. And the time can go precisely between zero and capital T. So in that case, if the particle was initially in the nth eigenstate of H zero, the state at time T will be the nth eigenstate of H of T, provided that the spectrum is discrete and non-degenerate throughout the transition. And of course, we're assuming that the Hamiltonian will change slowly enough in time. So that's, First of all, a very important part of the, of the theorem. Second, we'll clarify what exactly slowly enough means, at least intuitively. And so basically what is happening um, according to the theorem is that, okay, let's say that you start with the system at the nth eigenstate of H0, right? And so you're making the Hamiltonian change very, very slow, very slow, almost unnoticeable in a way. And so it will, uh, so the state will change also slowly in time. And it will basically always be at the antigen state of the instantaneous Hamiltonian H at time T, provided the Hamiltonian changes slowly enough. Uh, but you also know, I mean, this is intuitively clear, assuming that the transformation of the Hamiltonian in time is small enough. but. I mean, you also know that eigenfunctions are defined up to a phase. And uh, well, there might be a change in phase. First of all, one expected, because essentially, if you go to 
basically the other case of a time independent Hamiltonian, you know that the change in time in the wave function is according to basically the oscillation in the phase depending on the energy. So what you would expect in this time dependent Hamiltonian case is that you have the time dependent version of that oscillation, right? So when the Hamiltonian is time independent, basically you would have phase change of E of minus I E T divided by H bar where this is the nth energy eigenvalue. And now if you think about it, we're assuming that the Hamiltonian is uh, basically time dependent. Therefore the eigenvalues are time dependent as well. Think of it as the time as an index in this case, uh, index related to time. And so the time dependent version of this phase change when the energy is dependent on time, it's basically this. So you have the oscillation of a given phase where the phase, if you think of your OD scores, the integral solution for this is minus one over H bar. So we have the same factor. And then the integral from the initial time to the time T of basically the values of the energies um, over this interval. And we call this a dynamic phase, which makes sense because, I mean, this is basically the phase change that we have due to the dynamic evolution in time that we kind of expect from the stationary states in a way, but in this time dependent version, but there will be an additional phase factor and we'll denote that phase factor gamma gamma of n, depending on the nth uh, energy eigenvalue as well, and the nth energy level, and depending on time, of course, as well. And we're going to call it the geometric phase. Um, we'll say more about this geometric phase in a second, OK? So the formal statement of the mathematic theorem is the following, is that the evolution in time of the wave function, given all the assumptions that we have mentioned above, is that, OK, so this is the wave function, how it evolves in time, basically. This is the antigen state. This one is the antigen state of this instantaneous Hamiltonian. So again, T, think about it more like an index of time T. And then you have the changes due on one hand to the dynamic phase, given, yeah, the basically dynamic change due to energies. And then a gamma factor, uh, which accounts for the differences of this problem with respect to the time um, dependent case uh, beyond dynamic situations carried on by gamma. So this is quite intuitive uh, in a way. The proof is not easy. Um, we'll talk about the proof in a second, but I want you to get the intuition. So basically what happens when the wave function evolves in time is that, okay, if the Hamiltonian changes slowly enough, true, it stays in the instantaneous antigen state at each time, but there are two effects. One of them, of course, the time evolution carried on by this phase uh, change, the dynamic phase, and the other, this other geometric phase, which basically includes also the difference with the other cases that we know. And again, as we have mentioned before, um, the, well, this one, let's call it capital Psi, and this will just uh, Psi, right? So Psi N, is the antigen state of the instantaneous Hamiltonian. And of course, we think of T as an index. So at time T, the Hamiltonian, since it depends on time, has a form H of T. Then it has its own eigen solutions in the wave function psi n of T. So it's in, for the instantaneous Hamiltonian H of T. And then the energy level, uh, the eigenvalue En, depending on time. So the intuition, it's kind of clear. Um, the proof is not easy again, so I'll indicate the complicated steps of the proof, um, but I want you to see what's happening. So this is basically, we're kind of like satisfying the rule that it stays on the eigenstate, but these are two changes that we could expect, one dynamic, the other geometric. Now the proof, well, so um, part of it is um, direct to present, there is a big jump, especially at one step, that it's hard to justify. And possibly that step goes beyond undergraduate um, uh, preparation. So I'm just going to comment on it and give some heuristics. Uh, but I'm just going to sketch the proof uh, in general and indicate the non-trivial steps and what do they mean. <laughs> 
So let's assume, okay. First of all, let's think of the simpler uh, plus case, right? Um, where basically the Hamiltonian is independent of time. So this one we already know because in your previous course in quantum mechanics, you did basically stationary states and time independent Hamiltonians. So a particle starting in the nth eigenstate uh, satisfies the eigenvalue problem, h uh, psi n equal to the n psi n. And the evolution in time in this case, which is not what we're gonna focus on. This is just to present a simple example at the beginning. So if that was the case, the evolution in time will be this stationary state, which is um, time independent. It usually only depends, say in X, if you're in a position um, representation. And then the evolution in time, according to this phase, exponential of minus I ENT divided by H1, right? So this is for the simplest case that we already know and you know from your previous course. Now, let's assume that we're gonna allow the Hamiltonian to be time dependent, right? So, okay, it can change with time, it has a time dependence, and also the eigen solutions, meaning the wave functions and the eigenvectors, right? So again, time is uh, thought of as an index in a way, and for the Hamiltonian at time t, the eigen solutions um, are given by this, uh, where they satisfy this equation with psi n of t, the, um, sorry, the, the wave function of the instantaneous Hamiltonian at time t at level n, and then the energy uh, eigenvalue for the nth level. Now, um, let's think just for time fixed at this moment, right? So a given time t. I mean, we have assumed very nice properties, meaning non-degeneracy, et cetera, et cetera. So at a given time t fixed, the complete set of eigenfunctions satisfies orthonormality condition. So we have this and the time is fixed, okay? So, so far so good. Now, what we're gonna do is to focus on the time evolution of Schrodinger equation. So we're not gonna think only of, uh, of time as fixed and only of the eigen solutions at a given time but actually what happens when time passes by and how the capital Psi behaves, right? And so it satisfies this equation where the Hamiltonian is time dependent. Um, for a different, perhaps more general situation without making this adiabatic very slow change um, approximation. We saw this in time dependent perturbation theory. And well, for this problem where we focus on the time evolution, we express the solution of this problem as a linear combination of the time index solutions. So what does this mean? Well, I mean, we know that the given time t, this represents the wave function. This is dealing this phase with uh, the theta, uh, depending on the integral of the energies over a given time. This is basically carrying the evolution for the time dependent problem where this is taking care of the dynamic phase expected from uh, the time independent uh, version, but when the energies are time dependent. So this is more general. The difference to complete um, the cherry and the cake on the time evolution for this problem is to consider that this um, time dependent, uh, well, that these coefficients n are time dependent, right? So they can change in time. And so first of all, this is a formal admissible representation of the solution because at a given time t, this is basically a complete basis. So this is good at the given time t. When you consider the evolution in time, this is taking care again of the dynamic phase dependence on energies. And to complete uh, basically for any other foreseeable possible change regarding the time evolution versus the things that we know from stationary states, you allow these coefficients to be time dependent. So this is a good expression for the solution in time as linear combination of the instantaneous eigenstates times some factors that we expect the dynamic phase and the other. And again, uh, this one contains a time evolution of the phase when the eigenvalues are allowed to be time dependent. So what we're gonna do is in this equation, plug in this proposed solution for um, the time evolution problem. And we basically want to find the form of these coefficients to completely determine the solution to this problem, right? So we're gonna plug in Schrodinger equation this, 
So if I plug in, okay, this is the version in the series solution, uh, which is time dependent. Then you have the Hamiltonian operator and again, series solution, right? So the easy part, of course, by linearity, simply apply the Hamiltonian to the um, weight functions at a given time. So some terms come out and then you have this, which you know how to deal with. Um, on the other hand, well, these, all these three terms, uh, depending on time, you pass the time derivative to the sum or inside the sum. And then you simply apply derivatives as you know from calculus, right? So basically, I mean, each one of them will uh, carry on their derivatives and you just have to keep account on them. And the others or the other factors remain constant and noticing that we have exponentials here. So for the first case, of course, we have CN prime. So that's cool with Psi N and then the exponential. So, so far so good. On the other, the derivative is on Psi and then you have CN and the exponential. On the other, these two uh, remain the same. And then you take the derivative of this exponential, but well, I mean, it's an exponential. So you'll have the same factor times the derivative of what it's inside. And that's why you have the I theta prime N. So, so far so good. Derivative of basically a product of three factors. And then on the other hand, well, I mean, this is basically the Hamiltonian applied to its eigen state. So you pick up a factor of n. And well, some other things can be done. Essentially, uh, if you go to the expression of theta n, if you take derivative, basically what you will pick up is uh, theta prime n equal minus en divided by h bar, right? So this is where we have the minus en divided by h bar and then the i factor that we had from before. Well, so uh, expectedly, we can simplify some terms, especially this one. So this is dealing in a way, this is the representation of the problem as if the Hamiltonian was not time dependent in a way. Um, but you can cancel with these terms. If you notice, you have a factor of i h bar, which if you multiply by minus i divided by h bar, basically you get one. And so this will cancel term by term uh, with this other part. And only these two terms survive. And so you have therefore that I h bar uh, times the sum of only these two terms, C prime n psi n plus C n psi prime n times exponential is zero. You can forget of the factor I h bar. So that's fine. And you simply pass one of the summons to the other side, right? And so then you have the sum of psi n prime psi n exponential equal to minus sum uh, cn psi prime n exponential. So um, usually in these problems, as you have noticed in mm, our perturbation theory approaches, we project along the direction and use orthonormality, and this is not going to be the exception. So let's have this expression. Let's project along psi m. So this one is going to be simplified by a Kronecker delta due to our normality. So you only retain the term uh, c prime m. And you can actually pass this factor because all the other terms different to m will be zero in the sum. So you can pass this factor to the other side. Uh, and so that's why you would pick up a minus theta m over here. And then you still have the sum because the inner products are of uh, psi n with uh, psi prime n. So this is to be determined in a way, but so far so good. Now you have an expression for the time derivative of the coefficients that you want to figure. Now, you want to also consider the derivative of Schrodinger equation, excuse me, with our time dependent Hamiltonian. So we started here. And if you want also with the any operator, this is what we're going to focus. Um, so maybe I should point out that this is actually more for the eigen problem. Yeah, to clarify. So let's take the derivative of this, right? So you have on one hand derivative h prime psi plus h psi prime then equal to e psi prime plus e prime psi. So, so far so good. 
And again, we're going to project. Uh, you'll see why this is useful. So let's take inner product with respect to the direction psi m. And OK, for all these terms, right? So well, you have this one, then you have this one. It's clear that you're going to use hermeticity, or you're going to use the fact that h is Hermitian, even if it's time dependent. Then you take inner product. These ones are going to become easier um, partially because, well, E and E prime are scalars. So even if they are time dependent. And so here, I mean, this one is going to simplify because you have psi m. This one, probably not, unless, well, there is some simplification due to psi prime, but we'll see in a sec. So, OK, this one stays the same. Here you pass uh, h to the other side since h is um, Hermitian. And therefore, you can apply uh, operator h to psi m because this is an eigenstate. So that's why you pick up this em factor over here. So these two are equal to these two. And then, well, you took uh, e prime out. Then you have the inner product. That's why you have the Kronecker delta. And then you take simply the scalar out, and you have this, right? So, so far, so good. Um, let's see. So, OK, at this point, we, we um, are OK. We just have to consider uh, the, um, basically the case where n is not equal to n, right? So we consider basically this equation for the nth eigenstate. We projected along direction psi m, and we consider a different direction to this other one. So in that case, well, things simplify, of course. First of all, this factor will be zero due to the Kronecker delta. Second, uh, you can pass to the other side um, and you'll have the difference En minus En, uh, that factor multiplying psi m inner product with psi prime n. And then you still have this, right? So, well, uh, what you can do is actually express this term, which is of interest uh, if you remember our expression for the coefficients at this point, and this is why we did this whole procedure. Uh, so you can express this inner product of psi m with uh, psi prime n as basically this term, uh, psi m h prime psi n. So basically the matrix element of h prime divided by en minus en. And this is where the assumption of uh, basically the energy spectrum being non-degenerate is important, right? Otherwise you would possibly could have a denominator being zero and singularity is blowing up. So, and of course, uh, it's important to point out that we have assumed that the energies are non-degenerate over the whole adiabatic process, right? Where basically the variation of time from zero to T or capital T. So we're gonna plug in this expression in the formula that we had before, uh, essentially here. Um, and so, well, First of all, we can split this arm in the term of n equal to m, and then the terms n not equal to m. So the reason is that we want to use this expression, right? And this only applies for n not equal to m. We'll see why, um, or you can see why. But OK, uh, having made the, the distinction, uh, I simply substitute for the formula of this small term that I got here, and I plug in. And so far, so good. Equivalently, if I want to plug in the formula for this phases theta, I can remembering that they depend on intervals of the energy and with a factor of hr. Uh, so this is just the same formula with uh, the substitution of theta in terms of the energies. It's important to clarify, of course, at this point, no approximation has been made. I have only made basically the proposal of a series solution uh, for the time evolution, which is completely valid. That is analytical and is exact, no approximation. And uh, beyond the assumptions that we have made of non degeneracy, et cetera. But this is where we introduce the adiabatic approximation, and it consists in the following. So we're going to assume that h prime is so small that the terms related to h prime, particularly these ones, are negligible. You can double check actually by analyzing the case n equal to n that you would not recover a term related to h prime, by the way. So I'm not going to do that. You can do it if you want, but that's fine. But more importantly, the heuristics or the hand wavy argument of the adiabatic approximation is the following. It sounds intuitive in a way, right? Because we're making very slow changes. I mean, the transformation for the Hamiltonian is so slow 
that it's unperceptible and you can think of it as going to zero in a given limit. But this is actually, although it sounds intuitive, the non-trivial step of the proof, because you have to prove how H prime can go to zero without making all basically the changes in the wave functions go to zero as well in this limit. Because look, I mean, there is a very trivial case where H prime is zero and that is a time independent Hamiltonian. And for that one, we know that basically the states are stationary and they do not depend in time. So you can think of, well, the counter argument would seem, well, I mean, you're making H prime go to zero. Why do the wave functions uh, do not go to zero? That is on one hand, a non-trivial step of the proof. And the answer to that is that you basically have two different time scales. One is for the change in the Hamiltonian and the other is for the change in the wave functions and they are different. And provided that you can basically handle this in terms of these two different time scales, then it's fine because the Hamiltonian can change very imperceptibly because the time scale of the change of the Hamiltonian can be very, very large. Yet the wave functions can oscillate and change in time, et cetera, et cetera. And under that uh, time scale. And so uh, the change in, for the wave functions is noticeable without having a uh, change in the Hamiltonian noticeably. That's the core of this adiabatic approximation. And the justification is beyond the, uh, well, this course, because essentially for justifying this, you would have to go to grad school level of uh, basically discussing at least mathematically on two scale problems uh, related to homogenization. And so this is another side of perturbation methods um, that is more grad school material and beyond the course. But I think it's important to present the heuristics like the hand wavy argument of why this is happening and the fact if you understand that you have two different time scales, one for the Hamiltonian, the other for the wave function, you're good to go. So um, basically, well, yeah, the original rigorous justification is not trivial, but we have pointed out um, basically uh, that we have two different time scales, and this is what we would justify um, or how we would justify this part. Uh, well, thinking of the two time scales, we're going to assume that in these two uh, scale problem regarding time. Um, these terms are going to go to zero, which may uh, basically make all this sum to, or this sum to go to zero. Uh, you only keep this term. So this is why disregarding these terms going to zero, you have this equation and well, actually this looks pretty nice in a way because this is basically an exponential OD, which you can solve even for a time dependent term like this and the solution is this one, right? So the solution for this uh, exponential model in a way is, well, the value of zero times exponential of minus the integral in time of this term. And you can of course refine your representation of the solution, which is that you can define the gamma n that we had actually mentioned before. So this is i times the integral from zero to time over time of this term. So the reason we multiply with an i is because actually this gamma is real. And you can prove it quickly by analyzing the following. Well, derivative, well, this term or this term is always one by normalization. So the derivative with respect to time is always zero. Now, if you take derivative properly, it's basically derivative of one side plus the derivative of the other side, but you notice that actually one is the conjugate of the other. And so adding a term by its conjugate is twice its real part. And so this is telling you, formally speaking, that the real part of this term is zero, meaning that it's purely imaginary. And if it's purely imaginary, you basically have to multiply by i to convert it to a real term. Now, since you had an, a minus over this part, basically a minus one is equal to i squared. So you have a factor i, and then you have another factor i in here to justify the equality, and you're good. So again, this term is real. You multiply by i to make it real. We justified why in overall this gamma n is real. And we're gonna make an extra assumption, which is actually quite natural because we um, mentioned it at the beginning of the, of, of the statement of the adiabatic theorem, is that assuming that we have started in the n eigenstate, 
So basically the coefficients at time zero obey a Dirac delta, which is only non-zero for n equal to n. Uh, so, I mean, the series uh, solution that we proposed at the beginning uh, over here, it's gonna collapse because only one term will survive, right? So um, basically uh, going back to this expression, we keep only one term. Uh, and so ZM um, series uh, DNN, so on the CN zero will be one, the others will be uh, zero. And so this is one. And then, well, in the series solution, we only keep one term. This one was accounted for. This one we expected. This is the only one that is uh, different, right? So this is where the case for the only term surviving where this factor is one and you have this. And uh, just to remember basically, um, well, first of all, what was theta? It was this integral of the energies accounting for the dynamic phase factor. And most importantly, we have arrived to the proof, uh, well, to the last part of the proof, which is that, well, these are phase factors anyways, as you can see, right? I mean, first of all, this is also a real quantity. So this is just an imaginary phase, likewise for this one. And this is multiplied by the anti eigen state. So actually, this is giving the full time evolution in this adiabatic approximation of the two time scales for the problem where this is telling you that in fact, it does remain in the eighth and state for different Hamiltonians, right? So you can like turn on a switch to change the Hamiltonian very slowly. It changes the wave functions very slowly, but they always remain on the anti eigen state except for these other two factors, uh, which account one for a dynamic phase, the other for the so-called geometric phase, one comment on why it's called geometric in a second. And the reason, well, so except for phases, they do remain at uh, the anti state. It's important to understand which, uh, what these phases are. And uh, since it stays in the anti state, except for the phases, uh, which happens with wave functions in a way anyway, so we're gonna call the capital Psi, capital Psi M to stress that it stays in the A uh, anti state and this adiabatic approximation. So again, the result of the theorem or what we have proved so far under the assumption and the non-trivial step we have mentioned is that the wave function in fact does remain in the eigen, uh, anti eigen state evolving in time, but it picks up two phase factors. One is again, the expected time evolution associated to energies which is the so-called dynamic phase. And the other is due to the non-vanishing of the derivative, right? I mean, in the derivative approximation, although h prime goes to zero. So this is also stressing this non-trivial step in the derivative approximation, because look, the other phase psi depends on this integral, which depends on the inner product of psi n with psi prime. So again, you are assuming that you are in a two time scale problem where the Hamiltonian changes in time very slowly, but this is not negligible. And so this doesn't go to zero, therefore this is an inner product and this integral do not die. And uh, you still have that phase. So that's also the, um, basically the stress of the adiabatic approximation. And again, the nutshell of this approximation is basically the following. You have two evolution or two time evolution scales, one for the Hamiltonian and another different for the wave function. And the time scale to notice uh, change in the Hamiltonian is very large because Hamiltonian changes very slowly with respect to the time scale of the wave function evolution, which uh, oscillates uh, with phases known from eigen solutions and then also the gamma factor. And well, I mean, this is just the time dependence on the energies. So again, the intuition of the adiabatic approximation just in a more refined statement and also indicating the non-trivial step of the proof is basically reduced to, to these two different uh, scales or so-called two scale problems regarding time. So hope this clarifies the, the intuition of uh, this situation. One last comment uh, before we proceed to the example is that you would think at the beginning that the geometric phase is not important because well, I mean, anyways, wave functions are defined up to a phase, right? So what's, what's the difference? But I mean, there might be an important case where it actually is important. Um, excuse me, which is what happens if you make the Hamiltonian change in such a way that it returns to its, uh, to its original state at a given time. So you have a form of the Hamiltonian at time zero, H zero, uh, 
and at time t, you make it go back to h0. Um, so in that case, well, first of all, you would go back to the original eigenstate, given that the Hamiltonians are equal at the initial and final time. But on the other hand, there might be a noticeable difference um, um, in, in the state of wave function, because, well, on one hand, this could be expected, because this is basically the oscillation of energies had you had a time-independent Hamiltonian and, and uh, the stationary state oscillation. This is the difference that is uh, not accounted for. And so that's why it's very important, right? Because this is evidence of the change of the Hamiltonian in time and uh, beyond oscillations that are expected from stationary states. And so, yes, you will be again in the same nth eigenstate if you return to the same Hamiltonian, but this is indicating that you transformed it over time. And if you want to think about it that way, it's basically as if you, well, as if the Hamiltonian had been transformed like in a space of Hamiltonians, right? And it changes and it walks and it makes a path and at time t goes back to its initial point. And so this term, it's basically indicating uh, uh, the path that you took in the Hamiltonian when you walked along it. And that's why um, there is an important uh, notation for the change in geometric phase after an adiabatic closed cycle. Notice that I'm stressing closed cycle because we return to the original Hamiltonian at time t. Uh, this change in geometric phase is important. It's called the Berry's phase after uh, Sir Michael Berry, a very famous physicist. And basically gamma B is equal to the difference between gamma time T minus gamma at zero. Right? So it makes sense because this will be um, part of the factors that you will be observing. And so this is evidence again of the transformation of the Hamiltonian uh, over a closed cycle. And although you return to the original state, you have evidence of this transformation. And in a nutshell, I mean, to understand what we have done so far, I'm just going to paraphrase uh, Michael Berry. Uh, the quotation comes from Griffith's book. And I think this explains quite uh, succinctly what these different phases represent. So the dynamic phase answered the question, how long did your trip take? Of course, that makes sense because this is related to the evolution in time, the dynamics, and the interval from zero to t. The geometric phase, where have you been? Meaning that in the case where you have made a Hamiltonian go over a closed cycle, although it returns to the initial state, this and this present evidence of the path taken in the Hamiltonian space, although you return to the initial point. So try to think about it a little bit. Um, again, this is trying to show the distinction between this case of quantum dynamics where you have a time evolution and the Hamiltonian is transformed, but although you return to the original Hamiltonian, the situation is different from the stationary states problem where the Hamiltonian is completely time independent. So think about it for a second, try to review the notes. Um, yeah. So the last part of this lecture is that I'm going to present uh, basically an example of, uh, well, a situation of the adiabatic theorem. Um, I'll explain why. And the example is related at the end of the, of the problem. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to drink water because talking too much makes me uh, thirsty. <laughs> so, well, the problem is the following. Imagine an electron that is resting at the origin and it is under a magnetic field of uh, constant magnitude. But although the magnitude is constant, the direction changes and the direction changes in the following way. It sweeps a cone of a given opening angle alpha at constant angular velocity omega, as in this figure, which is uh, taken from Griffiths actually. So the intuition is the following. The magnitude is fixed it basically orbits or oscillates around this cone at a constant angular velocity or angular frequency also if you want. Um, yeah, well, whatever. And yeah, I mean, so the direction changes in such a way that 
Well, because it orbits around this cone or the axis of this cone, it describes um, this conic uh, with a given uh, angle alpha as represented in the figure. So the form of the field given the specifications is this. You have a constant magnitude, then basically vertically, you have a component cosine of alpha and horizontally, meaning in the xy plane, the component of B can change. And so it has a factor of sine of alpha, of course, but there is an oscillation at the angular frequency of the components related to cosine omega t for the x component and sine omega t for the y component. So this is expressing mathematically the physics of what I proposed. Now, the Hamiltonian for this problem is basically, well, you have E over M, so the charge divided by the mass, the magnetic field times the um, spin situation, and S basically has component, uh, um, well, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma C, H bar divided by two. And well, I just do an inner product um, where I'm gonna define a factor related to a frequency, which if I define a frequency omega one as E B naught divided by M. Uh, and then, well, this will be over here, accounting for this factor. Then I have to uh, remember that uh, the sigmas have a representation using Pauli matrices that you probably saw last uh, semester. So this is the way sigma X, sigma Y, which involves imaginary terms and sigma C are represented. And making the uh, substitution of these matrices well, here we'll have sigma x, sigma y, sigma c. Uh, some things to consider. Well, these two have a common uh, sine of alpha factor. Um, this is real, this is imaginary. Uh, these are related to off diagonal terms. This is related only to diagonal terms. So that's gonna be helpful in the uh, computation of these terms. First of all, because I can factorize the sine of alpha. And second of all, I can add these two. This is gonna account for the real part and this for the imaginary part. That's why you have cosine plus I sine then cosine minus I sine. And then here you have the cosine, which is related to diagonal terms. Um, of course, we can simplify this expression as a, a complex exponentials. Here you have E minus E plus with the sine of alpha. Uh, again, these are all diagonal terms and the diagonal terms are related to cosine alpha minus cosine alpha. And so if I introduce the factor and then add these two, this is taking care of the diagonal terms. This is taking care of the off diagonal terms with the factor sine of alpha. And so, okay, I have a quite compressed expression for the Hamiltonian. Now, with this factor of uh, h bar omega one over two, where omega one was the frequency that I defined before. Um, so um, I'm gonna prove um, that um, these are basically the eigenspinors, uh, of course, normalized of the of this Hamiltonian, uh, which are well the plus direction uh, depending on time, of course. So notice the time dependence for these two is over here. So for the plus part, you have in the first component cosine of alpha over two. And the second component, you have sine of alpha over two with this factor of e to the i omega t. And uh, for the minus direction, you actually have the exponential sign above with a minus and then minus cosine in the second component. So they represent the spin up and down respectively. And uh, its eigenvalues are e plus minus equal to plus minus h bar omega one over two. So I'm gonna prove it now. I mean, I just presented the solution uh, basically, I'm going to double check uh, that they are indeed the solutions of the eigenproblem, right? And for that, I simply have to compute h uh, psi plus and h uh, psi minus um, of given these expressions. So, okay, the Hamiltonian is this uh, factor times uh, this matrix that I got over here. And then uh, psi plus is again cosine e. Uh, I and then sign, right? So, so far so good. Okay, how can I verify this? Well, um, basically I have to do the product, matrix vector product. I have this, so, so far so good. 
I have these terms. Now, what I'm gonna do, since I see terms of cosine of alpha over two popping up, is to use trig identities to put cosine alpha and sine alpha in terms of cosine alpha over two. So this is taken care of in this part where I have the expression of cosine alpha in terms of cosine alpha over two and sine of alpha over two, remember your trig identities. Likewise for sine of alpha, it's equal to two sine alpha over two cosine of alpha over two. And then I do the same substitutions below. And well, what is gonna happen is that I'm gonna have some cancellations, right? So this term with the minus is gonna cancel partially with the two sine alpha cosine alpha blah, 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 because you have the sine squared. So actually all this stuff would be cosine squared of alpha over two times cosine alpha over two, plus sine squared of alpha over two times cosine of alpha over two. And there's further simplification of this because you can factorize the cosine alpha over two, and then you have cosine squared plus sine squared equal to one. And that's why you get this. For the other, there's also cancellation. You basically here have cosine squared uh, with a factor of two, then with a factor of sine, also a factor of phi omega. So there's also gonna be a cancellation of basically these two terms. And uh, yeah, with the, this part. And so that's why you only have a single uh, sine cosine squared EI. This one basically remains the same considering the change in sign. And so you have this, and again, you can factorize the, the sine alpha over two EI omega uh, T and then cosine squared plus sine squared equal one. So you get this only two. And oh, surprise, you go back to this one, right? The only difference is that you picked up a factor of h bar omega one over two. And uh, well, so this is literally h bar omega one over two times the uh, plus eigenspinner or the spin up thing. So, uh, well, so far so good. The proof for the eigenspinner minus uh, in down direction is very similar. You have this expression uh, with the Hamiltonian matrix as in here. You do the multiplication. Uh, you substitute using trig identities expressions for cosine alpha and sine alpha uh, that you did here. And you pick up the two sine alpha cosine squared because of this. And likewise, um, well, we'll have also uh, sine alpha equal to sine alpha over two cosine alpha over two. And then likewise, the substitution for the cosine. Again, you do simplifications, of course. Um, this is going to be related to uh, this substitution. That's why you have minus minus in this part. But again, you still have cosine squared, sine squared, which is going to simplify it to this part with a minus sign. Uh, likewise, well, basically, um, you have two sine squared minus sine squared. So that's why you have a single sine squared and then plus cosine alpha cosine squared. So again, you have simplification you do sine squared plus cosine squared, and then you have cosine of alpha over two. And now if you notice, this is almost as the original eigenspinner, but with a minus sign, right? Because here you have plus, here you have minus, here you have minus, here you have plus. So you pick up a minus sign, and then the factor h bar omega one over two. So indeed, these are the eigenspinners of the Hamiltonian with the related eigenvalues mentioned. Uh, plus for the plus, minus for the minus. So, okay, so far so good, we have proved it. Now, uh, let's assume that the electron starts with a spin up along with the magnetic field at the initial time, right? So the initial um, state is basically the plus again spinner, which by plugging in um, uh, t equal to zero, well, this is one, and so you have cosine sine of alpha over two as component. And uh, the evolution in time uh, is given by the Schrodinger equation. I'm not going to fully solve the problem. I'm simply going to indicate um, the solutions, which are quite reasonable in the sense that, well, I mean, for obtaining a time evolution, we will have to solve exactly the Schrodinger equation, um, where, well, the full solution, first of all, because psi plus and psi minus are the eigenspinners at a given time for a Hamiltonian at time t, they indeed represent the solutions at different time. And these coefficients 
would carry uh, the whole information or the final information regarding time dependence. So this is a valid um, representation of the evolution in time of the solution. And I basically have to figure out the time dependence of these coefficients to completely determine the time evolution of the problem. And this is just a statement of the initial condition that basically at the initial time I was in the spin plus uh, or spin up direction. So that's why, I mean, it will only not vanish for the direction plus over here. So just satisfying this initial condition. So again, the solution is, or the form of the solution is justified by the fact that again, spinners form a basis for the solution of the Schrodinger equation at any instantaneous time. Uh, if we were to solve for the coefficients, which is, I'm not gonna do it, but I'm just gonna present the result. Basically we will have that uh, C plus behaves in this way. Um, it has a factor of e to the minus i omega t with uh, this lambda that I'm gonna explain in a, in a second. So it has this cosine lambda, some lambda, and then uh, C minus has an exponential i omega t with uh, this factor and then sine lambda t over two. Uh, most importantly, this lambda, what is lambda? Well, lambda is this other frequency. So lambda is the square root of the original frequency plus the frequency, well, the squares, of course, of the original frequency plus the square of the frequency that we defined related to the um, magnetic field, and then some product, uh, uh, basically law of cosines um, term. Mm. Um, of course, I mean, by adding the terms appropriately, I could get the solution. This is not so important for me at this point. Uh, in fact, this is an easier representation of the solution in a way. But I, what I want to emphasize is that, well, okay, it's true that the spinners or eigenspinners oscillate at the frequencies omega, right? However, if you notice the dependence of the coefficients in time, you see that the actual full solution oscillates at, in a way to frequencies, right? I mean, so you have two time scales again. So this is important now I'll mention something related to the adiabatic approximation at the end. So we have the renal frequency in which the magnetic field is oscillating around the cone. But on the other hand, especially for example, let's say for this form or this form and this form, it's clear that there is a second oscillating frequency where the frequency lambda appears and it has these values, right? And it's related to both the original frequency of oscillation of the magnetic field and the second frequency omega one that we defined before. So this is starting to resemble the two time scales that we mentioned a little bit ago when we had the time dependence. So, okay. Uh, the coefficients uh, that define the time dependence of the evolution of the problem in time uh, have these two frequencies in both omega and lambda. And okay, what about the probability of transition uh, to spin down? Because we started a spin up, right? I mean, this was the initial state, the spin up. So, um, well, if we were to compute the probability of transition, we already know how, how to do that. It's basically to get the component of um, the time solution or the uh, basically the solution in time of psi with respect to the spin down and then take inner product of these two and then take norm squared. That is basically the projection along a direction and you know from time perturbation or even before from the postulates of quantum mechanics. So for that, it is easier to actually notice this uh, the representation of the solution in terms of psi plus and psi minus. So you only have to basically consider the norm of this coefficient squared, right? So, well, the i is not gonna matter for that. Then you have basically the rest are real terms and you disregard this because it's uh, basically a complex um, imaginary number of norm one. Um, sorry, a complex number of norm one, sorry. So you would only retain for the probability of transition, basically the square of omega over lambda, sine of alpha, sine of lambda t over two. And again, uh, you have these two frequencies, right? 
So this is the part where we mentioned the Dabatic theorem in the sense that we're gonna, in a way for the solution of this problem, do the Dabatic approximation. So in the Dabatic theorem, from what we have presented, the transition probability goes to zero in the limit as uh, one time scale is much bigger than the other, where we have two time scales. TE is the characteristic uh, time for changes in the Hamiltonian, so which is one over omega. And TI is the characteristic time for changes in the wave function, which is related to one over omega one, and this is related to phase transition. So first of all, I mean, why the adiabatic theorem would tell you the transition probability goes to zero? Well, because the adiabatic theorem is telling you that if you start in the eigenstate, you stay in that eigenstate, although it might change in time, but it's still the one related to the plus direction or the up direction, provided the change in the Hamiltonian is very small, which is exactly what we're saying. I mean, we have two time scales, and the time scale of uh, basically change of the Hamiltonian is very large compared to the time scale of oscillation of the wave function, so which is mostly related to omega one. So <clears throat> for Hamiltonian, well, yeah, the way it was defined don't involve terms omega, so it's clear that it's time scale or one over omega, it's, it's time scale since it's the inverse of the frequency. And on the other, we have to be careful into what we call the time scale, right? So again, the adiabatic approximation, thinking of the, this two time scale problem, which is quite revealed in this example. So we can basically solve or present the full solution of the problem. And then considering the two different time scales appearing, uh, appearing on the problem, if we analyze which linear is adiabatic, which one is not adiabatic, basically have an understanding of the adiabatic theorem. So in this situation, we analyze the adiabatic theorem by means of the lens of this problem, right? So the adiabatic approximation is gonna consist basically of this and just plugging in these frequencies means that the frequency of oscillation for the wave function is very, very uh, big compared to the frequency of change in the Hamiltonian. So, I mean, this is just passing the denominator, which means that omega over omega one goes to zero and so in this problem, this is what is constituting the adiabatic approximation. So again, physically, this means that the field rotates at the very slow angular velocity with respect to the phase of the unperturbed eigen functions. So, I mean, in that case, in this adiabatic limit, what we would have, just go to the expression for lambda, right? So you're saying that basically omega is very small compared to omega one. So from these terms, the one that is gonna be more significant is this one. And so lambda is gonna be approximate to basically the square root of omega one squared, which is omega one. And in that case, if we go to the formula, uh, well, this result is exact. Then we introduce approximation of plugging in lambda equal to omega one. And then we have the quotient of omega divided by omega one and then these terms, but we're in the limit where this denominator or sorry, this ratio is going to zero. So in this limit, precisely the transition to the um, down state is zero. So again, the probability of transition to spin down goes to zero in this adiabatic limit. So what does it mean? That basically we stay in the spin up most of the time. So the spinner stays in the eigen direction of uh, uh, chi plus chi, t chi or chi, I forgot sorry. So uh, basically in this adiabatic approximation, the spin always uh, points up with respect to the direction of V of T at the time T in the so-called adiabatic approximation. So let's go to the opposite limit, which is the non-adiabatic case, right? So in this case, I'm gonna assume that the frequency omega actually is much more larger uh, with respect to omega one. So if we go to this, actually what lambda would be approximate now would be to omega because uh, this is the most significant term. And if we go to the formula of the transition, well, we plug in in this approximation, well, we can still keep the lambda, it doesn't matter too much. Um, and basically, well, in this case, things do not go to zero. Actually, you have a time dependence, right? So, okay, this is fixed. And then this has a dependence in time according to this factor. So the system oscillates uh, in time between spin up and spin down. Uh, 
right? I mean, that's clear because you have design dependence with design of Android Kiva too. And basically the maximum value, meaning the time where the probability of transition is maximum is, uh, well, achieving the maximum value of probability of transition at that given time of omega over lambda sine over alpha when this factor is one. And it is close, but it's not equal to the sine squared, right? Because omega over lambda is basically less than one. Uh, well, yeah, have to be careful with that factor. But um, yeah, actually it's close, but not equal. Just forget what I said. So it basically has this form. It's close to this value if you plug in, um, yeah, uh, this factor over here, but it obeys this time evolution and you can um, represent this maximum by this term. So this is the opposite case of the non adiabatic term that perhaps we do not care uh, too much uh, at this point. But okay, this is trying to exemplify uh, by means of these two different time scales in the problem for the oscillating magnetic field around the cone for an electron at the origin, uh, how these two time scales appear in which limit the, uh, um, the limiting process consists on an adiabatic approximation and how it is showing that it never goes to the other eigenstate in the fact that the probability of transition goes to zero. So here, instead of in a way proving the adiabatic theorem, what we did was present the exact solution of the problem, then insist that they are, there are two scales in time for the problem, and then analyzing the limits of the relation between these two time scales, where you can observe for one of them, what exactly is constituting the adiabatic theorem and observe the consequences via the um, approximate um, behavior of the solution in that limit and the transition coefficients, which show that in the adiabatic limit, you do indeed stay in the spin-off state if you started there, if the approximation is adiabatic. So, okay, um, so far so good. This basically ends the adiabatic approximation and there is phase. Um, presentation with the basically the statement of the theorem, the proof of the theorem, and an example illustrating that, of course, the concept of various phase. I will leave a single exercise in the homework where you have to basically review the various phase for the adiabatic approximation for this example. Um, some references if you want to review it. I must mention that although this topic appears in the third edition of Griffiths, it is in way more detail in the second edition. In fact, the proof does not appear on the third edition, but you can look for the second edition, which probably is floating around on the internet and you can see the proof there. Um, that's what I have followed to present the proof in here. Although I have made more comments uh, on the two time scale, because as a mathematician, uh, well, I want to emphasize where the physics and the mathematics of this approximation in the non-trivial step of the proof is connected. <clears throat> and well, I mean, if you're curious in seeing like what the two scale problems uh, in time are, or these homogenization problems, you can look at a reference for perturbation methods, but it's not needed for um, either the understanding of the lecture material, neither for the solution of the, of the problem um, that I'm gonna put in the homework related to this topic. So, okay, um, best of luck. Uh, I hope you had a nice spring break and I'll talk to you very soon.